congregation to preach your gospel. I acknowledge that in myself, I am nothing. Without you, I can do nothing. But Father, I thank you for giving me the ability to speak your word. Now I'm asking, may the Holy Spirit go before me. Prepare each and every one of our hearts this morning that we would receive with understanding what the Spirit is saying to the church in this hour. I ask it in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. 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 Before I bring the, the message, the text, I'd like to see a show of hands. Don't have to say what or anything. I just want to see how many are here this morning that God has touched you in some special way, either healing, providing special needs, some special way. Would you just slip up your hand and say, praise God, all over the building, things that God has done. This do in remembrance of me. Let's think about those things that he has done for us. <clears throat> I want to read Romans chapter 6, verse 23. We're going to be looking at scripture this morning. <clears throat> For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Talking about two kinds of death. The Bible tells us it is appointed unto man once to die. Every man, woman, boy, or girl that is born in, this, in the world, Will, if should Jesus tarry, will die. But there are going to be many that are still alive when the Lord comes. Many church Christian believers that will be alive when the Lord comes to rapture his church. Okay. That's why the Bible tells us the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together to be with him in the, in the clouds with Jesus. Okay. Secondly, spiritually. People that have served the Lord, gotten saved, served the Lord, give their heart to the Lord, go back to sin. But the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. We walk away spiritual death. God cannot live with sin, cannot be in our heart and be our Savior in our heart full of sin. When we sin, we just, we die spiritually. What does that mean? If I, if I go fall back and sin and die spiritually, am I doomed for hell? If with a broken heart, you come before God and ser seriously repent. God will restore you. He will save us. Okay. So think about this. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I want to begin reading at verse 23. The Apostle Paul is speaking. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. That the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner, also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. Thus do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you drink, pardon me, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. 
Okay. Also, I want to look at Matthew chapter 26, and we're going to look at verse 26 to 29. Okay. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and said, pardon me, he blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink you all of it for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, listen to this carefully, but I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. I'm looking forward to that day, having that time with Jesus, like communion. He won't do it again until we're all together and he does it in the midst of us. So I ask you to think of it. Never forget, never forget that the punishment for sin, not simply suffering, but death. Okay. For the wages of sin is death. For the soul that sinneth, the Bible says, shall die. We need to keep in mind, Satan is going to try to come against you every day. He's going to try to bring something along that will either discourage you or get you to where you're wondering what is happening. I've had individuals go through attacks of Satan and say, Pastor, am I even saved? Why has this happened to me? Am I saved? That's coming from Satan. Okay. Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. We receive him, believe, and we are saved. It was not until Christ died that the debt for sin that was due God for our sins. Jesus died on the cross to pay the debt of all the sins that I have sinned, that you have sinned, paid it for us so that we would not have to spend eternity in hell. I remind you again this morning, eternity only one of two places, heaven or hell. Jesus died so that we could have a way to escape hell and spend all eternity in heaven with him. We must never forget Calvary, nor the price that was paid for the forgiveness of our sins. Folks, it did, our forgiveness did not come cheaply. It came through the life of Jesus Christ, giving himself to die on the cross for our sins. So when we come together, such as we are today, to partake of communion together, Jesus said, this do in remembrance of me. Yes, he wants us to remember, keep in our heart and mind, that he gave his life for us. Okay. But he also wants us to remember the things that he's done for us after we were saved. Okay. To keep him in our heart and in our mind. And every once in a while, we need to just kind of sit down and sit before him. I like to do it right here in the sanctuary, sitting there. That's where I use this, my prayer closet. And I just, once in a while, remind me, him, Lord, you did this. You did that. You saved me from this. You kept me from that. So is that scriptural? Well, if you go back to 1 Samuel chapter 30, you'll find that Israel's about to go for they were over and living with the Philistines. When Philistines were getting ready to go to war. David and his men were going to join with them. They refused to let him go. The leaders let his men go. They said, what better way for him to get back in the graces of his king? 
and to turn against us in the middle of the war. He said, no. So they sent him back to Ziglag, where he was staying. But when they arrived, after marching all night and part of the day, they arrived back. They found that Ziglag had been burned to the ground. All of their possessions taken away. All of their wives and children taken away. And when they saw it, over 600 men there, they began to cry out to God. They began, the Bible said they cried, wept, till they could weep no longer. Then they got mad at David, King David, and they said to him, if we had not gone with you to do this, we would have been here to protect our families. They were ready to kill David. And the Bible says, and I love this. David, hearing, knowing they're wanting to kill him, began to seek the Lord. My Bible said, he comforted himself in the Lord. How did he do that? He began to remind himself of all the times that God had spared him, that God had saved him, that God had provided for him through the battles that he had to fight. He began to remember to himself, remind himself all the things that had happened that God had taken care of. So what does that say to us? When we're going through hard times, when we're going through struggles, when we're going through the, the temptations of Satan, remind yourself, stop, remind yourself what the Lord's done for you, where he brought you from, and what he's promised to do for us. It's good to sit down once in a while and just kind of take a, a look at where we are and why we're there and what God has done for us, okay? I want you to picture in your mind this morning the disciples as they sit at the table with Jesus just the same night before he was taken. They did not fully understand the time, at that time, what Jesus meant when he said, this do in remembrance of me. They're sitting there at the table with Jesus, taking, as you will, if you will, communion, eating the broken bread, drinking the cup, and then Jesus began to tell them what's going to happen. And then he asked them, when you do this, it's an ordinance that he gave to the church, when you do this, do this in remembrance of me. To think about what he's done for us. Jesus' earthly ministry was about, about to be finished. He was about ready to go back to heaven to be with his Father as a sacrifice for our sins. To offer himself, think about it, a sacrifice for our sins. He was leaving with them instructions for the ordinance for the Lord's Supper, which we have read. Okay. This do in remembrance of me. Can't you imagine what it must have been like when they met together for the first communion after death, resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus? He told them, you gather together. Do this often in remembrance of me. So I've tried to think about that first communion, the gathering together of disciples to take it. I can almost picture them in my mind, sitting around the table, thinking, thinking about what the Lord had done. I see Matthew, and I read about him in the Bible, I see Matthew sitting there. The Bible tells us that Matthew was a tax collector, collecting money from the Jews to give to the Romans. They hated, the Jewish people hated him, even though he was one of them. They hated him. They felt that he was a cheat. They felt that he was taking money from them for himself as well. They didn't want to have anything to do with him. He's sitting there at the table, collecting their taxes. One day, Jesus 
walked by. Remember, Matthew's kind of an outcast, alone. And Jesus comes by. I can just almost see it. He stops and he looks at Matthew. He stops and looks at Matthew. Then he speaks and he says, follow me. The outcast, the one hated by his own people. Jesus stopped and he looked at him. Several years ago, Ruth and I went to a sing. It was uh, the Gaithers were singing it, putting it on. And Ruth and I went. There was another couple there that was singing with them. And they sang a song that really touched my heart. I can still remember it today. Okay. What a look. What a love talking and singing in that song, mentioning, what a look, what a love. I can see Jesus looking at Matthew, looking into his face, to his eyes. What did Matthew see? He's used to seeing scorn. He's used to seeing hatred. He's used to seeing accusations hearing things spoken against him. But when he looked into the eyes of Jesus, okay, Matthew saw it. He saw Jesus. He knew immediately, I need Jesus. I need Jesus. Okay. Again, look at Jesus looking at him. What a look. It wasn't a look of Matthew, what have you done? What are you doing to your own people? It wasn't that. It was a look of love and compassion and understanding. And for the first time in his life, Matthew saw real love. He saw the love of Jesus. Real love. Perfect love. He felt in his heart the love of Jesus and his soul was set afire and he followed Jesus. Jesus didn't say, Matthew, you've been pretty bad. Matthew, you've done thus and so. He didn't dig it all up. He forgot it, didn't mention it. Simply said, follow me, follow me. That's what he does for every true believer. Every individual that comes to him knowing I'm a lost sinner comes to Jesus and asks forgiveness of his sin. Jesus forgives it, forgets it, and says, follow me, follow me. Okay. Can't you remember when you first came to Jesus? How many, no show of hands, just answer yourself. How many of you remember, okay, when you first came up to Jesus? The love that filled your heart, the joy that flooded your soul. Remember that love is still there. He didn't take it away. He didn't change it. He loves you just as much today as the day that he, we cried out to him. As he loves us as much today as the day that he said to his father, I'll go down and I'll offer myself for them. In the Bible says, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This do in remember of me. I look at the table and I also see James there. And I believe that James must have begun to remember the Mount of Transfiguration. Let's take a look at Matthew chapter 17. Matthew 17, I want to read verses 1 through 8. 
And so it says, after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias, talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were sore afraid. Sore afraid. Sitting at the table, taking communion, I believe that James remembered that experience. Remember the love of Jesus as he took them up and let them be revealed. Let the Father speak to them. Okay. I don't know about you. I've never heard an audible voice, but I've wanted to, and I've prayed about it. I've heard him speak into my heart, and I know it's him. But I would love to hear an audible voice. So many times going through situations or praying for families in much need and other situations, I've sat down praying, and I've said, Lord, I just wish that we could sit across from each other at a table and just share with one another, that I could hear you answering my questions, that I could hear the sound of your voice. Have you been there? Have you ever felt that? Okay. I believe that James on the Mount of Transfiguration remembers that experience, remembers hearing the voice of God. This is my beloved son. Him. Okay. He remembered the first sermon. I want to remind you about Peter. Peter remembers the day of Pentecost. He remembers what happened when he was sitting there, filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the power and the glory of God filling the room, touching each and every one of them. The multitudes that are down before, below them on the streets, hearing what's going on and questioning, what is this? What does it mean? Some said, well, these men are drunk. But no. So I said, no, they're not drunk. It's only the ninth hour of the morning. No. Something. The Bible said Peter went down. I love this story. I read it over and over, and sometimes I just think about it. Peter, remember, Peter was the, the bold one. He was the one that had appointed himself as the Lord's bodyguard. Peter was always right there to take care of the Lord. Okay. But when he was filled with the Holy Spirit, he hears what's going on. Remember, Peter has never preached a sermon in his life. Never, never studied to prepare a sermon. Okay. He goes down, he sees the multitude, he hears their questions, and he begins to share Jesus Christ with them. He begins to preach. I don't know how long his message was, but I do know this. It was anointed of God. It was a powerful message. How do you know that, Pastor? Well, I read it in the Bible. Where? The book of Acts. You can read it. It says, 3,000 souls 
were added to the church that day. Hearing the preaching of Peter, when he gave the opportunity, 3,000 people came to the Lord. That's a powerful message. That's the power and the glory of God reaching out to touch the lost. He remembers that first sermon that he ever preached under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Folks, hear that again. The first message he ever preached under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. That tells us we can do nothing of ourselves. It all comes through him. He gives us the ability. He gives us the anointing. He gives us the opportunities. All praise, all glory, all honor belongs to him. Because without him, we can do nothing. Peter's remembering all of this. You see, I can remember back several years ago now, I can remember the night that I was filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the Lord called me to preach on a Sunday night sermon in a church in Pomona, California, an Assembly of God church. I was at the altar. I was just praying and seeking the Lord. All of a sudden, my prayer became more intense. I could feel the presence of the Lord. I didn't know what going on at the time, but as I continued to pray, all of a sudden I was speaking in tongues, praying in tongues. There was something happening inside of me. God was changing me. He was filling me, not only with his Holy Spirit, but he was filling me with a love for people that I didn't have. Okay. I got up from that altar, a changed person. The Lord done something in here. And I thank God today that that fire that he ignited back then is still burning in my heart. Not too long ago, a couple of, maybe three weeks, we had a memorial service for Denise's mother here in the sanctuary. And I shared some thoughts at that memorial. When we dismissed, there was a lunch ready, and I dismissed the people to go to the luncheon. And a man that didn't, art, didn't attend our church, I'd never seen him before. As he was walking up that aisle, he stopped right there and he looked at me. He said, I want to talk to you after this is over. I want to talk to you. You said something I, I want to know about. I don't believe, and I want to know. I didn't question him. As soon as everybody was gone, I walked out the door, and he was standing there waiting for me. And he shared with me what he, what he wanted. There was a man that had received Jesus as his personal Savior. And one day he was alone with the Lord, praying and seeking the Lord. And the Lord gave him a vision. He said he was caught up into the third heaven. And he, the Lord met him there and was taking him around and showing things. And he took him and showed a mansion that was being built. And he said, Jesus said to him, this is going to be your mansion. And the man was a carpenter, so he said, Jesus let him work on his own mansion for a little bit. And he asked me, Pastor, do you believe that? I said, no, no, I don't. I said, I know that there have been individuals that at one time or other had been caught up to heaven and let come back. But they didn't do any work. They didn't work on their mansions or anybody else's. Why? I said, because my Bible said this. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place, I will return unto you and receive you unto myself that where I am you may be also. What did he mean I'm preparing a place? God is building our mansion. It's a gift that God is giving to us. Okay, he's building it. We don't have to. Okay. 
So folks, believe what the Bible tells us, okay? I can remember that night, what God did for me. Still burning today, just like when that individual wanted to question me. He asked me, before he started to tell me what he was thinking, he asked me this. He said, do you love what you're doing? Do you love preaching? Do you love ministering to people? And I said, yes, I do. That's why I do it. God's called me to do it. Yes, I love it. And then he started on, well, then that man's a carpenter. He loves to be a carpenter. Why, do you, why wouldn't you think God wouldn't let him do it? And then I told him what I shared with you. God's given us a gift that he's making for us. We don't have to worry about building it. Okay. So I ask you to think about it. I ask this this morning. When you were baptized in the Holy Spirit, okay, do you remember that time? The first time when you were baptized? Like I told you, I remember that Sunday night just as if it was today. Because God did something. When he fills us with his Holy Spirit, he does something for us. And we need to keep it alive. Keep praying. Keep waiting upon the Lord. Keep believing him. Okay. If you look, listen to the Old Testament, read it, the building of the tabernacle. The priests, some of the priests had a job. Their job, they had to, they were kind of lamps, oil lamps that had to be lit and burning. Certain job of the, some of the priests was to keep the fire burning. They could not let it go out. They had to make sure there was always plenty of oil. They couldn't put the fire out, let it go out. Church, those of you that have Receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. He's abiding in your heart. Those of you that have been baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit, we must keep the fire burning. He ignites a fire in our hearts and we have to keep it burning. Pastor, how do I keep the fire burning? I keep the fire burning by reading my Bible, by spending time with him in prayer. I'm not talking about short, quickie prayers. I'm talking about getting in your prayer closet and talking to God, letting him know what's going on in your heart, giving him praise and glory and honor, allowing him to keep the fire going. Uh, folks, don't whisper your prayer. Don't pray it just in your mind. He wants to hear the sound of our voice. Let's talk to him. That song says, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. Okay. It happens when we talk with him, when we get alone with him. You need to talk it out loud. Don't think it in your mind. Don't try to rebuke the devil thinking. You have to speak it out to him. Just like Jesus did in the wilderness. Satan, I rebuke you. Get behind me. Don't think that he can't read your thoughts. Only God can do that. So let's think about it. Okay. I would like to go on and share with you others. Okay. I re remember the Apostle John sitting there at the table with Jesus, tears of joy running down his face as he remembers Jesus and what Jesus said. Okay. He said this. John is remembering it. He's yearning for it in his heart. I trust this morning when I share this with you that you are yearning for this in your heart. John 14, 1 through 3. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will return again to you. To receive you unto myself. That where I am, you may be also. John 
remembering Jesus spoke those words, sitting at the table, taking communion, this do in remembrance of me. He starts to weep before the Lord. Why? He's ready to go home. Even so, come quickly. There's a yearning in his heart to see Jesus. Before we take communion, let me ask you this. Do you have a yearning in your heart to really see Jesus? You're tired of the status quo. You want Jesus to come. Is there a yearning in your heart? Father, I come to you right now in the name of Jesus. I have brought the word that you put upon my heart. Lord, you know, and I know, I cannot change a heart. I can read my Bible. I can prepare. I can pray and seek you. Prepare the message. Try to preach it. But, Father, only you can change a heart. I'm asking today, before we take communion together, if there's anyone here that doesn't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, doesn't know him, that they would desire to accept him today, take communion with us. Every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. If you're here this morning, there's anything in your heart that shouldn't be, or maybe you haven't accepted Jesus, and you want to today, would you just quickly lift up your hand? Okay. I'm not going to call you out, but I will pray with us. All right. Yes, I see that. Now, put it down. I'm going to ask you to raise it again in just a minute. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Are you raising it to accept Jesus as your Savior? Praise God. Praise God, you can put it down. All right, anyone else? All right, church, I'm going to ask, I'm going to pray a prayer, and I'm going to ask all of you to pray it out loud with me. Individual that raised your hand, I want you to pray that prayer out loud with us, but pray it from your heart. Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I have sinned against you. But today, I'm sorry for my sin. I'm asking you to forgive me every sin that I've ever committed. I'm asking you to come into my heart. I receive you now as my Lord and my Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for saving my soul. Amen. Now the individual that prayed that prayer with us, Jesus heard that prayer. 